The following is a conversation with Dominic Falco, co-founder of Deep Science Ventures, also known as DSV. DSV is an incubator and accelerator focused on tackling some of the biggest problems that society faces today through the creation of new companies in partnership with amazing innovators and industrial partners. Can you, can you tell me about your tell me about your TikTok experience then? No. <laughs> My TikTok experience is just that the algorithm seat like works me out quite easily. I think I'm one of those people who like I don't even watch wrestling or basketball or or any kind of sports or I, I'm I'm not going to go out wrestling. Seek, I'm not going to go out and seek videos of people dancing, but the algorithm gets me it and gets then it'll you. just show me videos of people slam dunks and slam dunks and I'll, I'll just be there for like an hour before I realize <laughs> anything has happened and, uh, and instagram also has that kind of like rolling feed thing yeah that just which is that's new because it used to they used to stop you yeah and now they're probably mirroring tiktok strategy which it's is like the netflix cute. thing next episode you know like it, it'll automatically scrolls to the next thing when you finish watching this one so you don't have to even move it's i'm i'm scared of tiktok i've never actually even i've never even used it i've never seen it put this clip straight on tiktok <laughs> <laughs> this is a very tiktokable uh, tiktokable clip i'm scared because everyone i've spoken to like people i really like rate who strike me as very like productive efficient like on it people they're like yeah like sometimes i'm on there for like four hours and then i don't even like i don't even realize i've just been going down down or up 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 scroll 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 and that just never ends and i'm like i don't I don't want that. You know, I find that LinkedIn for me is addictive enough. You're on LinkedIn. I am on LinkedIn, but you find, <coughs> I've you find been and out. Um, I, feel a, I feel a little bit unclean when I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> is this part of the VC thing that we were speaking about earlier? Or I think it's just, if I'm there, I'm typically selling something. And, yep. And so or promoting yourself. Sorry? Yep. Promoting yourself. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And it doesn't come naturally to me in particular. Mm. And... I also am extremely competitive. So if I'm on LinkedIn, then I'm seeing other things that people are doing. I'm like, why am I on LinkedIn? I should be doing something, I should be doing something else. <laughs> the, the competitiveness that you have, has it always been like that? Or have you become more competitive since starting all the things that you've been doing? No, I've always been really competitive. Mm. Um, uh, I think most of my motivational drivers are kind of like unhealthy psychological motivational drivers. So like I'm driven by competition, by frustration, um, mm. um, very little by, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, the frustration I'm driven by is oft, it's kind of like the inverse of the really positive thing, which is things could be better. And my motivation is like the second half of that sentence, but they're not, you know? Right. So it's like, it is, it is ultimately positive. But, right. um, but it's the same with competition. It's like, I could be doing something better, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not. So that kind of, that competition, it's not, it's not a very healthy motivational profile because people driven in these kinds of ways just drive themselves off cliffs. You know, mm -hmm. like they achieve everything, one thing after another, thing after another. It doesn't matter if they're successful or failure, they'll always be unhappy. So quite, un, quite interesting. Un, I think they're quite unhealthy psychological profiles. It's and good self-insight though that you have. So are you working on that or are you just like harnessing it and going, I'm just going to use this to propel my business forward? I mean, I think quite a lot about what it means to be, um, like what it means for me to be successful rather than having kind of external. Right. Validation. Yeah. Well, external locuses of, or, or external definitions of that for me. Um, and that makes it easier to go after like idiosyncratic projects or projects which, you know, person after person says, why are you doing that? If I'm working on a track like that, then I know that I'm pursuing an internal locus of success, you know, something that I believe to be mm -hmm. fulfilling and important. Mm -hmm. um, Can you share what it means to you to be successful? I haven't really got a good still definition working, yet. Still working I haven't really got a good definition of it yet. Um, I know I catch myself if I'm seeking kind of external signifiers that I am, that I've slipped and I'm no longer thinking about it in the way that I thought I was, or if my immediate response to something going well is to tell people, then that for me is like a signifier that like I'm slipping from the kind of internal recognition of things that I believe to be good mm. towards kind of praise seeking or approval seeking or external validation in some way. I'm not like a big boaster anyway, but it's just something if you work in kind of like high ambition fields, I think 
I mean, it'd be interesting to hear how you deal with that. You don't seem like someone who um, is kind of driven or pursues external validation in that way. You seem like you've got really tight self-discipline, but mm-hmm. I wonder if this affect you nevertheless. I do have very, very tight self-discipline in the form of I got my routine. I got my things that I think are important. We were talking about the plants and the mushrooms earlier, the green juice, the gym. I'm also very tight and disciplined about seeing my family and supporting my family. I'm also very tight and disciplined about supporting my friends and trying to be a good friend. Um, I think that there's a few things that lead to health, a healthy, happy life. And that is discipline. Um, it's having like an 80, 20 rule where you're like 80% doing things that you know are probably good for your body and mind and 20% you're doing things that are probably less good for your body and mind. We all know what they are. (laughs) Um, I think that having a clean conscience is a fundamental part of being happy. So I'll try and just be truthful and transparent with absolutely everybody. And that resonates with my working life as well. I try and run the company as transparently as I possibly can, sometimes to my own detriment because I may be oversharing insights with people who don't need to hear those insights because they maybe get worried about, you know, where the company's at or whatever. Um, in terms of external validation, I, I'm i just very happy trying to fulfill my vision, which is I want to develop a new medicine. And that's been a consistent theme for the last like five years. I'm really excited about somebody calling me up and saying, I've just prescribed the drug that you conceived of in your head and you managed to take it all away from concept through to finished capsule and we've given it to that patient and they were in the hospital on death's door and now they're back home with their kids or they're back home in the garden or they're back at work. That that for me is just an amazing driver and motivator. We're talking about the social media. I, I do like everybody, I think sometimes get caught up in, um, oh, I need to share all my success. And I, and, and I think I, I do like everybody get a little bit drawn into the, the likes and the sharing and the validation. It's nice mm. to hear praise. Um, However, uh, I know myself that the most empowering thing for me and the thing that makes me most happy is just putting in a really honest, good days of work and helping other people fulfill their potential and moving the business forward. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, uh, you know, like everybody, I get drawn into (laughs) the external stuff, but I've got a good core focus within myself that keeps me focused and and moving forward. I've always been blown away by you. I think when we first met, you were still doing a medical degree while you were starting in antibiotics. And you also told me that you were working out every single day, no matter where you were, same routine in your hotel room, no matter what it was. And you just seemed like yeah. extraordinarily healthy. When was very that? Very happy. That was in, uh, that would have been in Shoreditch in late 2017 or, yeah. or early 2018. Goodness me, man, that's five years ago and I'm still doing exactly the same thing. And, so uh, there we go. Yeah. I'm really happy to hear that. I I forget. Someone said that to me yesterday. They were like, "I heard you talk in 2019, and you were saying, look, you know, burnout's a real thing, and you need to make sure that you don't get caught up in a bad cycle, and you keep going to the gym, and you keep eating good food." But mm-hmm. but and I, and I forgot, and I did that talk, uh, but it stuck with them, and seemingly it stuck with you just five years ago, living the same, on the same hype, and that that hype started to permeate through everything I do now mm. but with this podcast but also enterobiotics you get unlimited access to this green juice here that I'm drinking now which I absolutely love and I really hope one day press juices <laughs> <laughs> get involved in a more formal way um, <laughs> um, or I may myself start a green juice company Anyways, if, um, if they don't sponsor you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also do a subsidized gym membership, health and wellbeing allowance thing. Um, we allow, very unusually, allow people to claim gym access as a business expense if they're traveling. Because mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, mm-hmm. someone's going away with antibiotics, they should still be able to maintain their usual health and fitness routine. So, it's interesting, like eating is equivalent to exercise in the kind of sense of well-being while you're traveling, right? Oh, huge. And it's funny that we would consider disqualifying it in that way. Mm. <clears throat> 100%. I mean, <laughs> I think eating and what you put into your body, the whole you are what you eat. It, that phrase has existed for I don't even know how long. Go back even further and you've got Hippocrates saying all disease begins in the gut. 
let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food. Mm -hmm. So for thousands of years, maybe even longer, we've been saying, if you put good stuff into your body, then you get good stuff out. Mm -hmm. Okay. But <clears throat> how often do you see that message in McDonald's? Um, how often do you see that message on billboards? Very rarely. And that's because we as a society propelled by traditional capitalist constructs have decided that getting people addicted to sugar rich micronutrient light maximally processed foods is the way to go mm -hmm. but it's not it's complete opposite right yeah, yeah and i i mean i have sit, sitting in my drawer and i have for the last like four years a continuous glucose monitor uh, after having seen a talk by the founders of day two on I think it's titled yeah. um, The Ideal Diet for Human and the kind of messages there's yeah. not. That's Aaron. Yes, exactly. Yeah. What's his name again? Aaron Segal. In Segal, yeah. And Weizmann Institute in Israel, if people want to look him up. Yeah. Absolutely incredible yeah. uh, talk. Um, <clears throat> it was sent to me by one of our founders who was working on a microbiome concept mm. at the time. His name's um, uh, Shakur. And uh, it blew my mind because it was it basically said, oh, there's no, there's no ideal diet for humans. Like, what person A will have a huge um, blood sugar glucose spike in response to white rice, person B yeah. will not. To ice cream A, yeah. correct, for person B, not. And so even the kind of traditional, uh, like stay away from white rice or like highly processed carbs or whatever, they kind of fall apart. And the reason why McDonald's or, or any like major company is probably not on that message of like you need to work out the diet that makes sense for you personally it's because you can't mass produce a personalized diet really very effectively like yeah. it's very difficult we haven't yeah. really got the technology yet to be able to mass produce highly uh, tailored diets to people but i think it's a massive opportunity for the person who cracks it yeah. that that whole personalized dietary manipulation yeah yeah like have you seen anyone actually you see loads of super smart people and ideas have you seen anyone that looks like they might be able to do it. Lots of people talk about it as a long-term vision when they're starting with microbiome sampling as yep. part of a kind of health yep. um, strategy. Yeah. But it requires massive scale in order to have any kinds of economies of scale. Yeah. So imagine that there are subpopulations that there's only 10 people in that subpopulation worldwide who have this kind of specific diet you know, made up of these, made up of this particular composition because there's like 20 right. conditions. Right. Well, you have to be at quite a big scale in order to be able to benefit financially from some supplying to those 10 people, yeah. or you have to have technology for manufacturing it that's just vastly, vastly efficient. Mm. And I don't think that's impossible. I imagine someone will do it. And you can also just go down the curve, you know, from like, I'm, I'm imagining that there's a kind of normal distribution of diets. You know, there's probably some Definitely. Group of people for whom the, the vast majority can be served by a single diet. And so, kind of the irony of personalization is that you can just you can stratify that that group to work out where the largest populations are and serve them perfectly yep um and just tell the people on other people honestly like we just haven't got a diet for you it'll yep. be in stock in six months you know wow i mean i guess we do kind of know broadly speaking what the best diet is for the most people and that's like the mediterranean minimally processed i mean there's a few simple rules that i think you could apply to everybody and it'd be unlikely that someone would be of detriment so or would would um not benefit from it or um <clears throat> at least not go downhill one would be eat minimally processed foods mm -hmm. as a rule um avoid maximally processed foods mm -hmm. that contain lots of refined processed sugar and we talked about the plants and the mushrooms earlier. I mean, if I think if you're, if you're, and, and they are, of course, minimally processed. And one other way to think about it is what on my plate is for me here and what on my plate here is for my microbiome. Because we mm -hmm. don't possess the full suite of digestive capabilities to break down everything typically on a plate of food that contains fruit and vegetables. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of non-digestible celluloses in there and starches in there um, <clears throat> that only the microorganisms in our intestinal tract can break down. Mm -hmm. so, so we feed them and they gobble them up and chew them. And as little chemical factories, they start pumping out all these really incredible things. Short-chain fatty acid is the classic example. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of people don't realize is that there's a whole sweet the whole orchestra if you like a whole symphony being produced by the orchestra the orchestra being the microbiome of things we've never characterized mm -hmm. 
right? People talk about the dark matter of the genome. Okay, that's super cool. But what about the dark matter of the microbiome? Mm -hmm. and, and what products of microbial metabolism are influencing how we think and how we feel and our physiology? So <clears throat> that's why, you know... I was going to ask you like a really detailed question okay. about, about our ability to culture. Like, so last time I checked on the statistic, yeah. it was something like that we, we hadn't cultured 90% of the bacteria in the gut, never mind yes. all of the other species that we have. Yeah. So I think we've made a lot of advances on trying to... So I'll answer this in two different ways. One, for if we take the whole world and try and come up with a percentage in which the percentage relates to how much of the total microbial diversity globally have we actually cultured. Mm -hmm. And at, in the form of culture, we're talking about a pure culture where you can phenotypically characterize and fully genotype that particular strain um it's a low it's a low percentage right because mm -hmm. there's parts of the world where we've just done no microbiome research at all mm -hmm. it's so heavily weighted towards caucasian western populations predominantly over 70 percent of published research comes from this part of the world however when you talk about this part of the world people will say we're kind of we we think we're largely there um, but there's massive flaws that have been shown in the form of our reference databases are incomplete. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still probably a lot more to be discovered within the microbiome from a bacterial perspective. As you know, culture takes a lot of time um, and is challenging from a resource perspective because um, you've got to manually plate out, streak out, dilute, try and get to, you know, a single organism um, and let it grow. Um, but it's still the gold standard, right, for studying a single organism because if you can get it in pure culture, you can do whatever you want. Um, we do need to continue to work to try and establish exactly what's in there everywhere. Um, and you mentioned most of it's bacteria. It is. Mm -hmm. By most of it, I mean most of what we know is bacteria. Mm -hmm. But not most of the microbiome is is bacteria. I think we've placed more importance in the bacteria because they're easier to culture than viruses and they're metabolically active, whereas viruses are not. And there is definitely more microbial diversity in the context of bacteria than there are fungi. But that's not to say that the fungi and the archaea are not as important as the bacteria. Mm -hmm. Somebody at some point has decided, in the absence of any definitive proof or any definitive evidence base that the bacteria are more important and that's why when you look at all these therapeutic companies doing defined consortia they're typically always bacteria does that make sense it makes perfect sense i wonder to what extent you think that the focus on bacteria might be one of the root cause issues <clears throat> as to the failure of live bacterial therapeutics <laughs> well <clears throat> i think it's less so about bacteria being ineffective i think it's more so we have put the wrong bacteria in the wrong quantities in the wrong format into the wrong indications and not done science rigorously enough i also think that we have run we've, we've ran too fast and too quickly and we've we've taken that um statement which i made around they're the easiest to culture people have assumed because it's the easiest to study, that it's the most important, and decided that all of our drugs are going to be based on that thesis without it being supported by anything conclusive. And um, I think that we've decided to decide ourselves what the most likely approach is going to be without having an open and agnostic mind. So in the one hand, I agree with I think where you were trying to get me to go, which is We've decided bacteria are the most important, but maybe they're not, and that's why there's been failure. But on the other hand, I also think that our approach to bacteria as drugs has been flawed, um, and the science that we're doing now is much stronger. And the best case study for that is the evolution of what I'll call probiotics from the classical things that are useful in cheese production and so on, um, being really stable and easy to culture, and us going, yep, that's what we're going to use. We're going to use it for everything mm. to where we are now. And I know you've, you're probably more at the cutting edge of it than I am, actually, because I'm a full spectrum guy. And we can have that debate if you want. <laughs> um, uh, 
And we're now trying to rationally design live biotherapeutic products and think about, okay, what is happening in the patients? What's the pathophysiology? And how do the changes we observe in the microbiome contribute to that pathophysiology? And can we change the recipient's microbiome in such a way that it's going to influence the disease? And if so, what change do we need to make? And, and also specifically, what functional properties do these bacteria have? Right? Are they short-chain fatty acid producers? Do they produce loads of butyrate? Okay, butyrate. Why is butyrate important? Okay, colonic epithelial integrity would be a great example. Uh, valorate. C5, short chain fatty acid, probably important in preventing vegetative growth of C. difficile. We're now getting really technical on the microbiome, which is fine. But I did say before we went on, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pursue. So if I, if I bring us back a level, with you, um, <laughs> do you think there are good um, research structures or institutes for this kind of work? Do you think we're producing the kind of like, research outputs we need to, or do you think a like, different approach? Well, <clears throat> I know you're very passionate about the subject. I think that fundamentally our uh, academia in some respects is flawed and I will, I will not steal your thunder because I know you're very passionate about this and you'll probably speak more eloquent than I but academia is kind of interesting uh, we have these institutions that provide money and a lot of the people on the panels who provide the money are known to the people that are applying for the money mm -hmm. and there's probably some sort of selection bias there uh, we then uh, conduct the research even if it's unlikely to be any translation of value. Um, it may have been the same research that's been done 10 times before, but no one knows because no one publishes negative results generally. Mm -hmm. um, so that's wasted time and wasted resource. Companies may also have done the research, but because companies and academia typically don't speak to each other fully transparently and openly, again, there might be a duplication, duplication of research. Mm -hmm. We then get to the execution of the research, uh, which is typically done much slower than in a really high pressure environment. Like for example, um, if there was a comet coming to earth and we had to assemble a team to deal with it, they would be working in a way different to traditional academia, mm -hmm. I think. Got to hope so. We got to hope so. And then the publishing side of things is fascinating as well. It's all behind paywalls. Mm -hmm. It's a similar kind of thing with reviewers. Um, and typically, and this is my biggest frustration, most of the scientific research is applauded by others in the same field. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, we've made this groundbreaking discovery and all their friends clap and everyone at the conference says this is very ele uh, elegant, elegant scientific work. And it's just, mm -hmm. you know, how many people in the general public know about it and are excited about it? Unless the Daily Mail picks it up. So, so I think there's a huge amount we can do there. And we also should be in this country instilling an entrepreneurial commercial mindset in every single student at every level of our schooling system and every level of our university college system. I strongly disagree. <laughs> okay, go, go, go. <laughs> I mean, one thing is um, that you're talking about elegant solutions and uh, the kind of like academic game. Yeah. And it reminds me of a book by Herman Hesse called The Glass Bead Game, right. which focuses on it's a kind of pastiche of academic publishing and it takes to its logical conclusion the kind of academic pursuit and it imagines a kind of academic enclave in which people play this extremely sophisticated game uh, where they're trying to basically combine concepts um, in its, and the rules are never made clear. But this idea of elegance and the kind of aesthetic mm -hmm. potential of intellectual pursuit, that's kind, of what, that's kind of one of the things that happens. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. So I don't think every student and every scientist needs to be entrepreneurial. I don't think they all need to be engineers. I don't think they even need to be solutions focused. Uh, in fact, I think probably the kind of amalgamation of things that we need from academia is probably one of the things that's bottlenecking our ability to improve it. So we want patents, we want impact, we want teaching, we want novelty, we want everything, you mm -hmm. know? And we have this kind of limited pool of people mm -hmm. Um, who are trained in a, an extremely wedge-like way, you know, it's not, it's, I th what we probably need to think about is increasing the different functionalities and the different pathways through academia. Um, so in addition to training someone who's specialized in generating theories, and in addition to training someone who's specialized in testing those theories, um, 
we also probably ought to be training people who are specialized in applying those theories. Mm. It's so often neglected the idea that to apply scientific knowledge is also a scientific pursuit right. in itself. Right. And often a multidisciplinary scientific pursuit. In mm -hmm. other words, requires a different set of skills. But it's about, for me, it's always about augmentation rather than replacement. I think, you know, we've been developing our academic institutions for thousands of years. And the cons I'm, you know, not a conservative person, but a conservative like viewpoint on this is that's a heavily evolved machine that does what it was designed to do to some extent pretty well. You know, we, 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 we come up with hypotheses, we test them, and we, we then question those, and we publish them when we're relatively sure of them. Um, I mean, no one's questioning the robustness of the scientific method as being something which allows us to get to what we would describe as truth. Mm -hmm. And that's a very conserved principle, right? But then how do we take those truths and, you know, for one thing, how do we take those truths and, and assimilate them into a representation of the general truth? Right. I think this is done very badly. You try and, you know, there's like, how many papers published a minute? I read something that said- So many. There's something like 5,000 people in the world are publishing a paper every five days. Really? Yes. Who are these people? I don't know, but they're insane and they have to be stopped. <laughs> but it, but, it, it, but though, if you think about those as kind of pixels- That's mad. In the overall picture of what we know, yeah. those pixels are not being represented on a single screen. Those are pixels that are basically yep. flashing into, into life somewhere and then that light goes out because who is going to read that and see it as an, as an overall picture? I love that analogy. But the attempt to try and assimilate just into a general picture of a field or a subfield isn't, isn't done well. Now try and think about the kind of mission of interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, so multidisciplinary. On the, sorry, on the, um, on the point you just made about the little flashes, is what you're saying, so if you were to sort of segment all the various different disciplines and fields within the disciplines and so on, each of those has like a little flashing sort of exactly. screen. And, and there might be a flash in one place that if connected to a flash in another place, could be a leap forward in terms of knowledge and understanding. 100%. Yeah. Oh, they may be next to each other, but because we put semantic silos, physical silos in the way of those two flashes, you probably, there's no one look, who's going to be able to see them in the right. same, to be, to be part of the same message, right? And that, that when I was talking about the kind of, you know, you, if you have, if you wanted to augment academia, it'd be about how do you train people to see multiple flashes happening in different places at yeah. the same time. Yeah, okay. So we talk about kind of combinatorial innovation. Yeah. There's this real fetishization of the novel. When we think about tech transfer as the bottleneck to commercialization, it's typically because we're fetishizing the novel. We think because it's new, then it's something on top of what we knew before. And therefore that's the kind of definition of innovation. But so often novelty can arise from combining things we already yeah. know. Yeah. We just don't have a kind of de like a dedicated cadre of people focused on that. We yeah. think that's what industry is doing, but in a real specific way, that's not what industry is doing. Well, I mean, I would argue that I think a lot of our biggest steps forward are through combination rather than generating something mm -hmm. completely new. I mean, we'll use the microbiome as an example. The application of next generation sequencing technologies that were originally developed for profiling the human genome mm -hmm. were applied to the microbial genome and catalyzed this huge explosion. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't new technology. It was just the application of the technology in a different way, right? It's, so, it's, 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 there's, no, there's no single example of a discovery working on its own to, 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 to bring about some huge change. It's, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the things that have made a difference to our lives are a single discovery being translated. But that's the kind of I, the idea of a kind of pure uh, discovery, you know, something that is transformative, some insight. As long as we keep thinking about that, as long as we keep craving that like single thing that's distinct, yep. we're probably going to miss 99.99% mm. of the value we could have been generating and deriving from knowledge. Mm. And we're going we're gonna to fail to prioritize seeing that bigger picture as mm. long as we're focused on trying to work out which of the bright flashes is the brightest. Mm. Um, like take, so we were talking about the virome earlier. Yes. Uh, or talking about the microbiome earlier. Like we, when, we, when we looked at the microbiome briefly, we thought about it as a kind of broad problem. So. You, you, if you look, if you just think about it, like from the very top, it's like, okay, we have multiple species of microbiota in the gut. Already, already you've got something that's quite distinct from the picture that is being peddled by, or not peddled by, but like 
that's being pursued and the emphasis in existing and the existing sector. Um, so, I mean, who is going out to characterize the, the, the gut, the virome? Who's looking at the fungal species? Who's looking at the interactions between those? For one thing, there probably ought to be kind of a focused effort to think about the broader picture. Yeah. Um, for another, there are probably failings for existing attempts at resolving dysbiosis in the gut that arise from the kind of monodisciplinary approach to it. Um, and this is something I know, this is something that I know um, a lot of people have in the back of their minds, but it, it doesn't come up because we're thinking about, oh, we've discovered a species of bacteria that's in the gut for this, for this particular indication, but it's not for the, for the healthy population. Yeah. So this discovery is therefore the basis for a new company <laughs> without thinking about how you'd actually go about treating it. Right. right. Oh, well, you're speaking to a person who's in the full spectrum. Of camp. course. So I fully agree with you. Yeah. And, and it's a shame because we could have had a long debate there about why I don't agree with you if I didn't. But I, I do. <laughs> I, I do. I, I fundamentally think that we, we've taken this blinkered approach to treating disease. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you think about dysbiosis, which is a, a word that some people don't like that much in, in, the, in the field because it can mean so many different things. But if we, if we, in this context, say dysbiosis is a change from normal or a change that's driving a disease process, something that could be remedied to impact on physiology in a positive manner. Then dysbiosis, as far as I'm aware, is very, very rarely caused by one bacteria. I mean, C. difficile infections may be one example, but that's as a result of the rest of the kingdom and the ecosystem being destroyed through antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So it's still not you know, a uni-species problem. Mm -hmm. I get very frustrated when people say, yep, this, this single strain, it's going to be transformational. I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. You sure? I know it's depleted in that patient population reproducibly, but have you really profiled all the other elements? Mm -hmm. How do you know there's not a bigger change in some fungi or some mm -hmm. virus that's more important? Which is why I am of the view firmly that the companies that are going to win and have the biggest patient impact initially are the ones that say, right, we are not, uh, we're not pretending to know everything that's going on within the microbiome. We're not professing to understand the full interaction between the microbiome and the host physiology, including the immune system. What we do know is that the fecal transplant studies seem to work. Mm -hmm. And in some indications, the results uh, from the studies say the same thing. And those studies are performed in different countries with different donors, mm -hmm. with slightly different protocols. And on the one hand, you have the academics saying, we, we, the protocols are all different. We can't, we can't do FMT in this indication. And I'm saying, well, okay, you've got seven different, and the ulcerative colitis is an example, mm -hmm. seven different studies, seven different investigators, seven slightly different inclusion criteria, slightly different protocols, but it's all having a superior effect over the placebo. Mm -hmm. That to me feels really compelling. Mm -hmm. Right, And it's hard to take all of that and say, right, this is the protocol we're going to use to treat our patients. Mm -hmm. I get that. But um, <clears throat> when you look at all of that, and that to me says, okay, a company or an academic or somebody can take all of that and make the assumption that something that's comparable to the fecal transplants in terms of we're not trying to destroy or remove any one component or isolate any one component. We're just taking something from a healthy person and moving it into the gut of someone that's not healthy with this indication is more likely to be successful than any one singular constituent component because we've not actually tried that, mm -hmm. right? So that's why for antibiotics, what I've been saying is I want us to be the global leaders in full spectrum. I want us to be the safest, most effective, most scalable form of fecal transplantation ever mm -hmm. and will ever be. Because I think that's most likely to work initially. Mm -hmm. And over time, we might hopefully be able to deconstruct and figure out, can we take a more refined version to this? But it might be like blood. You know, how long have we been talking about creating synthetic blood for? Like fully synthetic blood. We don't even know, like, what blood is another another example of something where we don't know what most of the constituents of blood are, <laughs> like biomolecules in blood. It's like breast milk. Yeah, like, we we don't know what most of the biomolecules in 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 breast milk are. Yeah, um, these are these are like kind of um, population scale challenges, uh, yeah. which are as profound and vast as the human genome was when it, when we took on that challenge. Yeah, 
why is the human genome project and us profiling the genome just not really kind of had as transformational impact as Tony Blair and Bill Clinton were sort of professing when they announced it to the world? They said everything was going to come from this. You're asking the wrong person. We should have caveated <laughs> long ago <laughs> that, my, that my expertise is not in therapeutics. And everything I say about it, if you ask me more than two questions, I'll probably run short. <laughs> where, um, where, okay, where, where can we go? Is it climate? Is it agriculture? Company formation? You do so much in so many different areas. Why don't, why don't you tell us about your journey with... DSV, how that started, how it's going, and where you want it to go. Yeah, absolutely. If I start with, like, so I don't have a scientific background. And so it's kind of unusual that I would be here in, working in this field in the first place. If I explain that first, then yes. that might clarify Do that. Um, why I'm on this podcast. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, although maybe not. <laughs> um, I initially was focused on, so I was quite into social activism when I was a teenager and um, ran a local political activist group, um, broadly frustrated with, with a number of things, driven into study social sciences. When I got to university, I basically concluded that politics probably wasn't for me. <laughs> uh, one of the big things for me was I found it really hard to persuade people to change their preferences. Hmm. So Polit political preferences. Any preferences. Yeah. So we're talking about um, preference for meat over preference for plants and fungi. Yes. It's very difficult to persuade someone to change their preferences. It really is. Yeah. You sit them down and you lay out all the logical arguments and you say, you know, this is ethically wrong, this is bad for your health, yeah. it's expensive, bad for the planet. And they'll sit there and say, yeah, but I, I prefer meat. And it's very difficult to argue yeah, with yeah. preferences. I like the taste of meat. Yeah. I like the taste of meat. It makes me happy. It's part of, you know, like, am I going to sacrifice my happiness for... Yeah. And it's, and it's difficult to, to argue with preferences. So I spent like a few years arguing with preferences at university before concluding that maybe I should just leave them the way they are and try and influence the way that those preferences acted on the world instead. So, you know, you can have the same set of preferences but acting on a changed world and you'll get a very different outcome for health, for climate, uh, ethically as well. So one example is I love beef burger, substitute it for a, an alternative and right. you've already changed all of the issues there. It's going to be cheaper, better for you, better for the environment, et cetera. I didn't even work in that field, but it's like a really neat example. Mm. And I was really obsessed with vegetarianism when I was at university. And so I, I, it's like kind of a light bulb came on my head, which was we can, if we just sim simply change the world around people instead of trying to change their preferences, then, you know, we, we cut through a lot of the yeah. policy dilemmas that are sort of about either restricting choice or about allowing choice to go unchecked and cause damage. Instead, we can just give people better choices. And those better choices are typically enabled by science. And so I ended up taking a job at Imperial College, working with early career scientists and engineers. And I was incredibly passionate about the idea that experience is a bad predictor of performance. And instead, creativity, ambition, drive, and indexing to the good are typically better predictors. Um, so I don't, so for me, I didn't really care whether or not people had started a company before or if they'd worked at Goldman Sachs or McKinsey or Tesla or SpaceX. Those are bad predictors for me as to whether or not someone's going to make a difference in the world. And so working with early career scientists at Imperial was like a really obvious kind of co like, co like kind of um, coalescing of these two mm. uh, ideas for me. And I, I was able to work with a guy called Mark Hammond there who had a lot of the same views. Mm. He'd started an accelerator program, which I worked with him to run for a few years. And what became extremely frustrating was that- When was that? 2017 That was like 2000 that. and he started it in 2011. Yeah. Just around when the very first accelerators in the UK were getting awesome. going. And I joined in 2013. Right. And Mark's ambition was, he, well, he was just really excited about innovation and change. Mark started at the other end of the journey. So he's got a PhD in artificial intelligence and neuropharmacology. And Whoa. he was developing epilepsy drugs on living neural cultures. And trying to evolve the cultures um so the work he did is actually ridiculous and it's hard to get him to talk about it but he realized that the kind of neural cultures they were using to test epilepsy drugs neural culture so this is like a, a, a cultures of neural tissue of brain tissue yeah wow in a, in a petri dish in a petri dish it, it, but understandably these weren't representative of the human brain. <laughs> we think <laughs> not well i've met some people no <laughs> and so what he sought to do was try to make them more brain-like so yeah. he's like, what, what do brains do? Well, they learn. 
So he put them into robots and then trained those robots to navigate mazes and then tested epilepsy drugs on those neural cultures and got much, much better results. Whoa. Yeah. So that he had these. Mad. This, this was really, this long time ago. I think I know. 2008, 2009, he had robots controlled by living neural cultures. That is absolutely mad. <laughs> so he, it gives you a flavor for the kind of guy that Mark is. He's an, he's, that, he's sounds like some, that sounds like something out of a sci fi film. He's brilliant and insane, and I was, it was like one of the Can greatest fortunes of my life to meet him. I'd like a neural controlled robot. I actually think that maybe the reason why Mark is so productive is that a lot of his daily life is controlled by these robots in his house. That's what I like to picture. He's just out of shot of a robot combing his hair. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Um, wow. So, but, he, but he then tried to make that into a drug, and what he ran up against was this, on the one hand, the drive to publish on the other hand the drive to commercialize down the commercialization path there were no more papers yeah down 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 the publishing page pathway it took us away from the the, the kind of the commercial steps required there's no more papers because you don't want to tell anyone you, you don't, don't want to tell anyone yeah. yeah you're not necessarily doing anything that's you know yeah. you're not investigating big open questions anymore yeah. you work you're focusing on the things that we already know yeah i mean we I'll speak about the antibiotics perspective for a second. We have a lot of data that we could publish, but we don't because some of it's sort of what we think is a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. It's secret sauce. You basically have to put your career on on pause from a from an academic perspective. From an academic yeah. perspective, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and so that tension exists inside of those institutions because they were designed for yep. rightly for the creation and and amplification of knowledge. Yep. And then what we don't have really is like somewhere where you can move science where you can still be working on something prestigious yep. and you can still be moving at light speed, um, but you're focused on, you know, the brightest minds applying that. Yes. So, um, so anyway, Mark left academia and worked in clean tech. He had the misfortune of working through the clean tech bust while he was doing in fundraising. When was that? That would have been in the, uh, like through the early noughties, basically. Right. And he ended up working at. So clean, I actually don't know this. I don't know anything about this. So clean tech was a like a hot thing. Yeah, a hot's the wrong phraseology, but clean tech was the thing, and then it just died for a while, did it? Or yeah, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people out there who are clean tech veterans, and they're kind of like kind of sighing at the sort of clean tech hype that we're seeing at the moment. Really? Oh yeah, because we went through the we went through that with biofuels, and we're probably going through it now with direct air capture. Um. It goes up and it goes down. And the dream was that we would, there were lots of different kind of struts to the, to the last clean tech bust. And we probably ought to not cover it in a lot of detail because I don't know if your audience is going to care about it in particular. Pro but probably, they probably are interested, yeah. In, in, in essence, we, we got the economics wrong on biofuels. We pegged it to being cheaper than oil and gas, which were kind of artificially high at that time. So it looked very realizable. Right. We also underestimated the biology challenges. Of biofuels. Of biofuels. Yep. So the ability to manipulate these organisms and then the ability to move them into mass production and right. the difference between working at small scales and large scales. Yeah. We also, you know, as a result, had a huge amount of money lost and therefore kind of the diffusion of cash from that subsector. Yeah. And if you look at the numbers, invest, and that's how a lot of funds are constructed, you look at clean tech as a segment and you say, well, Everybody lost their hats in that in that in that bust. But well, why would we go back into it? So we're kind of in like we're kind of in like climate tech too. But if we'd started and sustained through that bust, we'd be in a really different place from where we are now. Because a lot of people left the field, moved into completely different fields. This is so hard to recover or to be successful if every other company within your umbrella has failed. And all the technologies have failed, right? So you're talking Absolutely. about- Absolutely. It's, it's impossible because every investor you go to goes, oh, no, I'm not touching that field. Because so many people have lost so much money. But it's you know? fundamentally at odds with what we know about innovation, which is that up until the thing, up until the time that something succeeds, everything has failed. Yes. So if, if, if what you're indexing to is whether or not things are working, yeah. well, you're probably going to miss the, the most important breakthroughs. And so hype cycles are just as- really dumb way of working in scientific innovation in particular. Maybe they work in tech to some extent, but because you require that kind of conformity and that kind of group movement. But in scientific innovation, if there's been a lot of failure in that field, that means that the greatest success has still not arisen. Um, and so, for example, like LBTs right now are a really good example where probably we're, we're not that far away from discovering something that makes sense 
or broadly in 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 the treatment of microbiome yeah. and and gut disorders yeah just because things haven't worked spectacularly to, spectacularly to date there's no in principle reason why they won't and we see signs of success in lots of different subsets but 100%. if you talk to investors they're like no no uh i've just seen a lot of people lose their money yep. really good academics world leading academics in their yep. field who've started companies if they if they failed then why would we think we know better when we're, we're not that far off in in that field or in any other field where we've seen long term failure it's yeah, just we'll about see. It's about looking at the specifics of each case yeah. rather than trying to gauge the broad trend yep. in a field of success or failure. Yeah, there's various different views. And one view, as you say, is, no, you know, um, so-and-so blue chip VC backed company X back in 2014. They got burnt. And as a result of that, I've always been out the field since then. Outrageous. I can't, or, I can't believe how uh, so often I hear this. Yeah, yeah. And um, another one would be, oh, well, we believe the microbiome is important, but we're just not sure why. And we're going to sit on the fence. <laughs> That's a classic. That's honestly a classic. Um, and another one is, will we think someone at some point is going to crack it? Uh, that one I don't mind because that suggests that they might get involved and back the company they think is likely to be successful. But there's a lot of watching and waiting. What I believe will happen is, I think there's a company out there right now, today, that's going to do it. Mm. And by do it, I mean outstanding clinical results beyond prevention of recurrence of C. difficile infection. Mm. And when that happens, it's going to explode again and everyone's going to want in. But the people who back the company who does it are going to make huge, massive returns because the valuations right now are not that high. And they'll probably have been in for the long run mm -hmm. and they'll win big. Mm -hmm. when really really big i think within the next five years we're going to see it in general i think it's the same pattern as when as the thing that kind of drew like drew me to work with early career scientists yes they're uncredentialed they haven't yet proven themselves but the things that will lead them to be successful are already there and are already obvious if you talk to them yeah those people it's the, the personality traits personality traits the drive the like the intellectual curiosity yep all of, the, all of the signs that this person will be successful are there. Everyone who has ever had a great idea, before that, they were a person who was just about to have that great idea. And it's the same with companies in, this, in these spaces, right? If you use success as a predictor of success, yeah. you're going to miss the most interesting things. It just it seems to me like a form of intellectual apathy and laziness to wait for the signs rather than trying to read them yourself. Um, it's one of my great frustrations and the reason why I work at the earliest conceivable stages of science and innovation because i think that's where that's where it really takes intellectual engagement and curiosity and yep. the desire to make things better yeah so um you were talking about mark and he started the accelerator and i'm bringing you back because you're just about to jump into like the thesis i think of what you're doing and, and and that is super early stage idea formation and nurturing and then helping people take that initial step right um yes um but if we go back to when you met um mark how did it kind of take shape and was the thesis then the same as it is now or has it evolved and all the things that you've learned over time? Mark and I were running a traditional accelerator program, which means someone came up with an idea and they came to us and then we supported them to develop that, right, that idea. That's a really common and familiar Classic. formula. Yep. And often when I explain DSV, the first question people ask is, so people come to you with an idea and that, that's so natural because we think about the idea as primal. Yeah. That's the first thing. And actually, if someone hasn't had a good idea, then maybe they're never going to have a good idea is also a really common way of thinking about it. So we use this as a filter. At Imperial, you have like 10,000 people, academics okay. through students. And we used to run an accelerator program for 20 companies. That was the subset of people who'd had an idea. Yep. Because I was there for long enough, I often would see that people who hadn't yet had an idea subsequently did have an idea <laughs> and could think about the process by which that came about. Yep. And often it's deeply imperfect. So the most common one, the one that was least successful, uh, but sometimes very successful, as in like really lossy, is, for example, a biomedical student doing their PhD would read a TechCrunch article about an app concept. Yep. And they decide that in order to be an entrepreneur, they had to design an app. And that was just, because, that was just a function of going through the, the early 10s, like 2010s, was like everything was apps. And so it doesn't matter whether or not you were an aeronautical engineer or you were doing a PhD in oncology, yep. you'd, pitch, you'd pitch a photo sharing app or a network app or an e-commerce website. 
And what that makes lays really clear is that the ideation process mm. is is just deeply flawed. Yep. Either people are commercializing the specific thing they're working on, or they're looking to the trends today and they're trying to source ideas from those trends. And if you really want to make things better, neither of those are particularly great methods. So the analogy, there's a, there's a woman on our team called Laura Fletcher in our therapeutics team. And the analogy she uses is that a biomedical scientist starting a company based on something they've discovered is equivalent to an engineer tinkering with something in their garage and then trying to make it into a car. You know, it's, that's, a, that's not a good way around solving problems. Mm. You've got to go the other way around. And you also, if you're building a car, you're probably not going to just work on, for example, the material coating spark plugs and then try and build a car around that. You know, you're going to have to combine many, many different components yep. to get a functional product. Yep. And so we left Imperial basically with a very, very simple thesis, which was if we support people who are high potential and we build multidisciplinary cohorts, we get that kind of bigger picture feeling that like multiple pixels in the same place. And we just give them dedicated time outside of an academic environment then ideas will spark and form, especially if we stimulate that, um, that environment. And over time, we've got more and more specific ways just by observing the way ideas come about as to the, as to the most productive, most impactful way to develop ideas. So mm -hmm. someone in our first cohort, his name was Murat Tunaboilu, worked with a, 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 um, an engineer and thinking about the problem of antibodies and like how do you develop better antibodies. Okay. Um, and he looked at the way we do it today, which is basically by trial and error. And he tried to work out whether or not you could do it rationally. So rational design of anti antibodies. And someone pointed out to him that there are, more possible, um, there are more possible ways of producing an antibody than there are uh, molecules in the universe. And so he called his company Antiverse. Oh man, I love that. To take on this kind of like seemingly impossible challenge. And every academic... By the way, that is a mad statistic, isn't it? It's probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, no i hear i know i know where you're going with it is that it's a it's a number that's just huge it's absolutely yeah. vast it's a huge number yeah you have to be totally out of your mind to to hear that yeah yeah, yeah. and then to say actually yeah. i'm going to name my company antiverse yeah yeah because it represents the impossibility of the yeah. tasks that i'm pursuing yeah, i think that's amazing yeah and because we were in a multidisciplinary cohort we were able to run workshops with people who had been basically reconditioned to think about focusing on the hardest part of a problem and thinking about different ways of doing it. So there was a cell-free um, specialist called Rowena Westermeyer in the, in the cohort. There was someone who had a specialism in deep learning and they, we just had these brainstorms trying to crack this problem. And they came up with the thesis that ulti ultimately became the company Antiverse, which is now having incredible success. Really? Focusing on rational design of GPCRs. Oh, which amazing. are famously really hard yeah, because yeah. you take them out of the cell and they go all floppy. Yeah. Really so it's for the listener G protein coupled receptor. Yeah. They're like gateways to the cell essentially. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So this, we had a couple of examples where we, we saw this kind of process working just not because we had planned it like that, but because yeah. someone in the cohort had fixated on a, like a clear problem. And so we went through iterations in designing the program around these kind of sparks, these yeah. kind of processes. And where we've got to now is we're on, we're six years in, we've done 35 companies. We've gone through different phases. That means you've started them and have you put any money into them as well? Yeah. So yeah. We, we, we do the whole thing from, you know, we, we identify somebody who we think could be an incredible founder we or part talk, of the founding team. talk about that. Yeah. 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 Um, and then we go through the phase of the processes of um, developing a thesis, growing their team. We fund that whole process. It, now, it used to be three months that we'd fund them. Now we spend up to 18 months going through that landscaping process to really understand what the kind of critical intervention could be. Um, that's all full time. That's all fully funded It's dedicated as if it was a vocation, you know, this vocation of applying and understanding science. Love that. And then we provide some seed funding, pre-seed funding. We typically do this alongside a partner. So yep. in therapeutics, um, the team is run by uh, a woman called Kirsten Paffenfuss, and she's put together this consortium of different uh, amazing players. So if we're working on cancer, we work with Cancer Research UK. We're doing some work on pediatric oncology at the moment with the, with the Ch Children's Tumor Foundation. Wow. We work with Cystic Fibrosis Foundation on cystic fibrosis, wow. on producing cell and gene therapy with the cell and gene therapy catapult. So we work with these really specialized partners and they, they help co-fund the work. And then they also invest and provide facilities and resources to the companies at the end. Fantastic. But we're not, we're not going through and translating 
the research of Cancer Research UK. We're working with them as a foundation to explore the broad space and understand what kind of the kind of global maxima are. So it's not like it's not like trying to work out the discovery of a of a scientist in Cancer Research UK's network and trying to translate that particular discovery. Again, it's combinatorial. It's trying to work out what, given what we know, and it's hard to understand what we know. You know, that's why you need these kind of specialist partners. What what is what are the things that are limiting us that have meant that we haven't solved these problems? Right, right. Um, this is really cool. Mm-hmm. How um, beyond the, the amount of Monday, money and um, time you spend with the founders, how, how has your approach changed to cultivating the innovation? And you've, you've got years of experience now in fine tuning what works, what doesn't work. So, so let's, let's take it from, on the one hand, how do you find a good like, founding team? Mm-hmm. You mentioned, and we'll then talk about how you like, mix together the technologies and what your advice is on IP and stuff like that. But so what, what makes an incredible founder? in your opinion, like what's the thesis at uh, DSV? Yeah, so we... Because if you could sell that. Yeah. We don't know. And I think anybody who says <laughs> that they do know uh, is probably lying. Yes. Yeah. And even if you go with one of the very, very large... So someone told me that SHL, their psychometric test has 44 million data points. Whoa. And if you ask them for predictors of entrepreneurial performance, they basically can't tell you. This is something that not that many people have a really good data set on. And we definitely don't have 44 million data sets, uh, the data points. Um, so in other words, I don't have a statistical sample sufficient to give you a predictive answer. I haven't done controls. Um, <laughs> but what we do look for and what we know is successful on, from stage to stage as you yep. go through the venture creation process, we, because of the process we run, we start with an outcome. Say you want to cure cystic fibrosis entirely. Yeah. What you need to break that problem down is someone who can do really good first principles thinking. First principles thinking is kind of a cliche in venture capital at the minute. Yeah. Um, we employ it in a very literal way. Mm-hmm. So we try and work out what, and we literally map using um, a particular way of scoping the space, what the possible constraints and sub outcomes that need to be true for the higher level outcome to also be true. Um, you need someone who's really creative, um, which means they can they can look at something that seems impossible, like like Antiverse did for a long time. You need someone who is first principles thinking, which means they're willing to to like cash something out into the really obvious naked assumptions. Okay. So the very most basic things that you would take for granted. There there are then the kind of the 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 types of expertise you need in order to be able to do that in a particular field. So we look for deep technical expertise in the first place. Um, you typically, even if you're very creative and you have great first principles thinking, unless you understand the landscape relatively well, it's going to be an uphill battle for you. So we look for someone who's understood the space and has thought creatively about it. Mm-hmm. We then look for kind of personality characteristics. So we look for uh, a set of things that we describe as magnetism. Magnetism. Yeah. People are drawn to them. Exactly. Yep. And that's because we need that person to then, we need to then build a team around yeah. that first person. So yeah. after the first three to six months, we start building the rest of the founding team. That's because typically from that high level outcome of, for example, cure cystic fibrosis, we've got a very specific subthesis developed through that process of first principle yep. thinking. What's your thoughts on if someone's had failure before? So um, in Scotland and the UK, and I guess I know the, the UK less, but if someone's just come off the back of a failure, they're like, whoa, well, don't touch them with a barge pole. However, <clears throat> I'm just back relatively recently from my first trip to the west coast of the US and just spending time there most people are like yeah that's that happens you just reinvent yourself and you you carry it with you it's almost like look failing sucks okay it's it's rubbish Mm. no one enjoys it but bouncing back and using it as like part of your toolkit to make you better next time I think is more readily accepted and the US and here. So if someone's come to you and they've just had a failure, does that put you off or do you go, you know what, they learn from it, we can help make it, you know, we can help them be successful. I think one of the things that's really interesting to me about you is that when I think about why I find you so impressive, it's not because necessarily of what you've accomplished, it's because of the way you think about yourself and the work you do on yourself to get there. So the kind of virtues of James as a person rather than the achievements of James as a person. And achievements are kind of markers and they help you see those virtues, yep. but they're not necessarily required like on the outside. Mm-hmm. 
I in general think that focusing on, for example, I know VCs who only back exited founders. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. serial entrepreneurs. Yeah. And and for me, those are kind of really rough and dirty heuristics for the personality char characteristics, attributes, et cetera, of a person yep. that you could work out by talking to that person, even if they hadn't yet exited. So yep. before they exited, <laughs> they probably had those characteristics. Mm -hmm. And after they exited, they just have a public recognizable signifier of that. They have a credential. Yep. And people want to be involved because of the same thesis as the people who only back exit founders, right? Exactly. It's that success breeds success and they've got a network and they've got people who want to go in again because of this I mean, are previously exited founders more likely to exit again? Is there like a statistic there? This is one of those things where they're more likely to raise more funding, yeah. but that's because everybody in VC mm -hmm. is more likely to give them more money because they believe that, you know, yeah. it's, you get these, um, these um, echo chambers that are really effective at pumping VC metrics yeah. and so therefore f creating self-fulfilling prophecies yeah. or autocorrelation is the kind of jargon in VC. But for me, there are other, other, other ways of garnering that kind of, that kind of, you can in, in in securing funding. One of the things is to look past the like facts of failure or success to the person themselves and try and think about whether or not they have the underlying characteristics. Yeah. Um. To repeat that. Yeah. Or to to bypass the thing that caused them to fail the thing the time before. Right. Yeah. So I don't. We're not indexing on success or failure. Yeah. Um. And I'm not. I'm not, if Adam Neumann, the founder of WeWork came to me having had such a massive high profile failure, yeah. I wouldn't be getting ready to hand in my money because I'd be looking to the person and asking, is this a person I want to give my money, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I think that, a long story short, I wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't know if I would either, but I, I personally think that the, the, one of the most important traits is the burning desire. Mm. And it's not the burning desire to be famous or the burning desire to make lots of money um although i do think that if people want that badly enough they can get it it's the burning desire to um have an impact and the burning desire to create something and take it forward mm -hmm. that to me i think is core if i look back to 2017 and even before then when i started to go to these student pitching competitions there were a lot of people quite excited to be there and they wanted to tell everyone that they'd won the prize and everything like that. But how many of those people were really willing to do what it takes to make that successful? And what does it take? It, what it takes is putting the work in every day, whether you want to or you don't want to, whether you feel good or you don't feel good, whether the sun's shining or it's raining, whether it's uh, typically a public holiday or not, you're going to be thinking about your idea because that's what it takes to create something from nothing and to make it big. Um, so if I was an investor, I would be, I'd be thinking, is this, do they have that burning desire so that even when it's really hard and they've been kicked back, knocked back, told their idea is rubbish, that someone's going to overtake them, that so-and-so invested in that company and they failed, they go, yeah, okay, I'm moving on to the next thing. As in not the next idea, but I'm moving on to the next person. Yeah. Just like, boom, that's fine. Uh, I can take that. So we, we talked about being, we, talk, we talked about the, about the idea of being driven by frustration. One of the things that frustrates me most is that we don't cultivate that desire or those sources of motivations in people. Mm. You would kind of hope that education would be a place where you go to work out yeah. what drives you and why. That's really interesting. You, but instead, yeah, we basically assume that people will kind of organically develop that. Yeah, I think it's just a massive omission. Uh, yeah. maybe the world would be, it's not obvious to me, the world would be much, much better if everybody went around like a crazy person, like hugely driven to solve everything. Maybe it's better that it's a minority, but I do go around looking for those people yeah. who are just, they are deeply passionate about something. Yeah. Sometimes they haven't yet had the idea yet. Yeah. And that's the subset of the deeply passionate people that we focus on. Yeah. Um, so they come to you or you come to them and they, you say, okay, they're really passionate. We can maybe fit them into this field that we're working on, right? That's a really interesting question. So, because in the early days of Google, apparently not using Google is like the poster child for everything good about the world, because I just, I'm not sure it is, but apparently Larry and Sergey used to just hire like really unusual people who'd excelled in things. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I read that they hired former astronauts, NFL players, uh, people who'd reached the like 
maybe I'm going too far with this now, but like paper folding champions. Paper folding champions. Maybe I've got, maybe I've gone too far there. Is that have I just made that up? But like uh, like you know, people who are exceptional at a domain, no matter what the domain is, because they've achieved a level of excellence. You've had to put the work in every day mm -hmm. for a long, long time, mm -hmm. no matter what. And I think their thesis was we just need to hire crazy smart people who are going to work really, really hard, mm -hmm. no matter what they were doing before, mm -hmm. because they can repurpose themselves. I mean, there's lots of examples of professional athletes who have had to retire, mm -hmm. who've gone on to make it big in the corporate world because they apply the same discipline and drive and motivation and work ethic mm -hmm. to their new, their new thing. Um, so going back to the question, uh, you know, do you find people and then help them fit into something or help them create something? Or do you more like, you know, have a cohort of people already there now because you've hit a critical scale at DSV? So when we started, we were, we ran an application based model. So people would apply to come and yep. be at DSV, but no, you don't need to. Well, we 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 st we still accept applications and and it's a really good source of candidates. But if you rely on it, then you miss you miss certain categories of people. So if you are really driven, then it's unclear why you wouldn't be working on the thing already. Why you would why you'd apply to come and do it at DSV? Most likely, you'll be working at the best place in the world to do that thing. Mm -hmm. So say you want to say you want to, for example, cure. Alzheimer's or ALS, it takes a kind of insane person to be like, I'm going to try and do this on my own. Um, and I'm going to just be working on it. And I'm going to look around for places I can do it like that, that are outside of academia. So for example, the founder of Reflection Therapeutics, he was working at the ALS Society, focused on trying to landscape and understand. The this is one of your portfolio. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The, you know, often these, these people are already working at the forefront of the field and you have to find them. If you really want to solve the problem, um, so we, so we built a, a kind of search engine for talent that allows us to find people if they're already in one place, in a, in a specific place. What, what is that? It's a tool you have? It's like yes. a toolkit? Or yeah, yeah. So program? We, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of software. Um, we, have, we have like a couple of components. One is for finding people and one is refining ideas. Right. You know, and the two are kind of form a virtuous cycle, which allows you to find more and more specific people who allow you to develop more and more specific concepts. Yeah. And that's the kind of engine at the heart of DSV. Yeah. On the finding people side, um, we realized really early on that if we wanted to find the best people, we, ha we have to find them ourselves rather than relying on applications because we're typically working on quite specific, quite niche concepts. Yeah. Do you define the concepts now as well? Have you got big themes that you work to? We've got a really, we've got a, like, amazing in-house teams. We're, we're about 25 people at the moment. Yeah. And these in-house teams focus, they're permanent staff at DSV. They focus on- All employees, yeah. Employees. Yeah. They focus on maintaining and growing a thesis in their sector. So each sector has a dedicated team. And if you think about it as a tree that they're kind of nurturing, they're nurturing that thesis to kind of bring out opportunities that might bear companies. And they're there just basically growing this picture of what the constraints to achieving their top level outcomes are. So in the, in the therapeutic space, it's like, it's just the idea of, of, of curative therapeutics. So what are the barriers to curing the worst diseases? Mm. What do those look like across indications, across population subtypes? So we're doing some work in inflammatory disease, for example, which is, like, it's like a, a vast group of like 80 different diseases. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, a lot of the pathways are the same. Yeah. 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 But, uh, and so the, these dedicated teams are kind of like nurturing these, these theses. And then as they become mature, as in, as we start to see, actually there could be, you know, between two and three different things we could explore and they're cohesive as in like one person could explore them all. Then we typically uh, will go out, we'll find a partner, we'll, we'll, we'll recruit a person specifically for that and area. the partner you mean was an entrepreneur or? As in, a, as in um, for example, in Cystic Fibrosis, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And they put some money in and they help yeah. you. Yes. It's cool. And the purpose of that is that we, instead of trying to solve problems for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, we have a specific thesis and we're being supported to work out what the most impactful thing is. Yep. So um, dedicated teams nurture these concepts and those concepts give rise to a thesis that allows us to find those specific people. Yep. And we then run those searches to work out where they are. Yep. What are the big themes at the moment? So is AMR one? 
Like, because we're I, not doing any work in antimicrobial resistance at the moment. I feel like that's like impending doom. Yeah. I think it's, it really is like, we all know it's such a big problem. And we all talk about it being a big problem, but companies just die all the time because they don't have that proper pool, you know, incentive. Um, and it was a theme for us. So these, these opportunity areas for us, we, we have them temporarily, we build them okay, uh, and then we close, close them down. Um, we built two companies out of our antimicrobial resistance yep. theme. One is a company called CC bio that recognized the kind of impending apocalypse yep. implied by antibiotics. Yep. And they develop intelligent therapeutics, they're, they're, they're live therapeutics and they are activated and respond to um, bacteria that signify a disease state That's is cool. arising. That's um, cool. So they're kind of computational um, bacteria. That's cool. Really cool. And the other one was a company called Ancilia. Uh, it's kind of the flip side of CC Bio. So it's not unusual for us to build yep. multiple companies at once that have kind of companion theses. Interesting. So if you want to solve a problem, it's unlikely you're going to do it with a single company. Yep. Uh, and Ancilia is focused on the viral component of the gut. And they are focused on characterizing the virome and developing immune um, bacterial strains that can then be put into the gut to have a much higher probability of engraftment. In the, in That's the, in super the cool. They're, they're actually focusing on, uh, on ulcerative colitis and they have really good ex vivo results um, for this and for some other... Concerns. The London-based team? They're in New York. So we, we recruit ah. people wherever they are. Um, and we allow them, actually, Alex Sakatos, the founder, um, she came to London for a few months to spend, to develop the company before uh, co-founding Ancilia with Rodolfo Barandru, who's the founder of Intelia and Locus and okay. um, a few others. And with um, Alex, uh, founded with David, um, who was uh, the associate director for bioinformatics at Mammoth. Whoa, cool team. Really good team. She, yeah. she also has a PhD in microbiology from Harvard and is like a force of nature. Oh, wow. Um, they're brilliant. And so they're based in New York. We recruit the teams wherever they are. Yeah. Um, we're open to fully remote founding teams. Um, because what's the probability that the best founder for this for the most interesting concept is going to be here with, in London with us? You know, it's just like really right. low. Right. Um, yeah. So the world is our cohort in that sense. That's right. really, really cool. So you're also now location agnostic. Totally. Um, um, yeah. What about the um, like some of the other big problems that we're facing at the moment? I know there's so many. Like climate change being one of them. So is this a key area of focus? Yes. So actually, uh, it's, it's, it, I'm very rarely on podcasts about the microbiome, James. <laughs> um, but we talked about a lot, which is good. Yes. I, yeah. I, think the only, I think the only other podcast I've done is a climate podcast because most of my work is on climate. Yep. So I, I, look, I look after the agriculture and climate teams at DSV. Mm -hmm. They both have dedicated teams. Um, the climate team is run by Adam Tomasi Russell. He's uh, a PhD chemist from Oxford, but he was the managing director of a computational material science company called Lab Genius for a couple of years. Oh, yeah. I to raise from some yeah. the best VCs in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And he came to DSV to run our climate team. And under, under Adam at the moment, we're working on a number of really big themes. We're working on decarbonizing transport. We're working on the critical minerals, bottlenecks and supply chains required for the renewables supply yeah. chain. Yeah. We're working on carbon removal. We've got three different uh, streams on carbon removal at the moment. What's the difference between decarbonizing transport and carbon removal? Like decarbonizing transport is no fossil fuels and carbon removal is removing carbon from the atmosphere? Or? Exactly. So yeah. one strand is about preventing carbon entering the atmosphere and the other is about removing the carbon that's already there. Okay, got on, it. On a parts per million basis, we need to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. That will yeah. happen naturally. If we stopped emitting today, it would happen in a kind of natural way anyway, but it wouldn't happen fast enough given that the fact Even that Even if we, we stopped completely today? Well, given the fact that we are, we haven't stopped completely today. Yeah. And it's not going to happen anytime soon. We need so. to do both, basically. So we, we, we kind, of, kind of sidestep the moral hazard of carbon removal, which is that if we, the moral hazard being, if we remove carbon, then we reduce the pressure to reduce emissions. Oh, right. Um, by trying to do both simultaneously. This is the idea of companion theses, you know, like a whole picture thesis, which is yep. we need the most efficient, most effective carbon removal technologies we can. We also need to be making it make sense to have carbon-free processes that are alternatives to our existing ones. Yep. Um, How close are we to that vision? Carbon-free alternatives to the ones that we have right now? Pretty far. 
Yeah. 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 I mean, we were talking earlier about how human preferences uh, are hard to change, but the world around them is easier. Yeah. And if you, th the only exception to that is if you change policy. So we can either wait for policy to change the preferences of firms and the preferences for firms at the moment mainly focus on making as much money as possible. Um, or we can make the alternatives to uh, emitting things, uh, to emitting carbon as profitable. And so, yep. and so we are on the latter side of, we kind of need to be policy agnostic, just fixated on making uh, alternatives to petrochemical processes as profitable as possible. Because even if there is a even if there is a policy change, it will be a tailwind for these companies anyway. So it's it's the dominant strategy. And also, if you think about the petrochemical supply chain, it's kind of insane anyway. Like we sail these boats, massive tankers out into the middle of the ocean. They're like small cities, and then we deploy this infrastructure in the ocean, which is the most hostile environment on earth to deploy something outside of a volcano, basically. And then we drill kilometers down into the earth to remove this hyper complex fluid, which then needs to be refined through uh, several fractions before it's then useful. Yeah. Um, it's also vastly inefficient, which is why you have so much byproduct carbon dioxide and other byproducts like sulfur. Half the time, natural gas itself is a byproduct that we just flare into the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, surely there is a more efficient way of running economies. I, it makes sense because there's high energy potential there, as in like the processes that create yeah. petrochemicals they're energy intensive. They took millions of years and they produce yeah. something that's high in energy. It's, it's, it's ready for us to use, basically. Yeah. But the process of converting wind and sunlight into energy or harnessing the like, biological processes that naturally produce on store energy and biomass, these seem to be more intuitive ways and less mm. wasteful ways and therefore ultimately more efficient ways. Mm. Mm. As in the global maxima for energy production, probably not going to be in petrochemicals ever. No. It's probably going to be in the sun. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So logically, the most profitable way of producing, capturing, using energy and materials that arise from the use of energy is probably going to be down that direction anyway. So we have that broad kind of utopian thesis. Yep. And then we have this. Which I like. I think it would be great if we didn't have to. I mean, when you describe the supply chain like that, it's kind of comical, isn't it? Just the lengths. Of Insane. Yeah, 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 yeah. But there's so massive industry. Mm around that you know mm. think about the size of aramco for example mm -hmm. it's like one of the biggest companies in the world all the infrastructure the capability mm -hmm. that they've built just to extract that fluid from the ground whereas we all see the sun hopefully depending on where we are in the world most days this is a bit of a change in tact but we sometimes ask why we do both climate agriculture therapeutics yep. why do them all in the same place mm -hmm. are they not so different that you should do them in different places and specialize differently and one of the really interesting corollaries between therapeutics and the pharmaceutical industry and oil and gas and the energy industry is the vast efficiency of the operations that are incumbent. They have evolved over a hundred years or longer to do one thing very, very specifically. So small molecule drug discovery and, and, and pharmaceuticals is so embedded yeah. and the processes are so efficient. Yeah. that the thresholds to supersede them in terms of price efficiency and efficacy are so high. It's right. very similar with trying to, for example, for biofuels to supersede um, petrochemical fuels. It's the same kind of challenge, which is that even if the technology is long-term better, in the short and medium term, it will inevitably be worse than an industry that is subsidized and has employed millions of people and everybody has a vested interest in the continued success of. And those kinds of constraints to, to commercial success, they constrain innovation in clean tech the same way that mm. they constrain innovation in pharmaceuticals Fascinating. and agriculture. You know, our food supply chains are similarly efficient uh, and therefore embedded. So you're creating companies in clean tech. The clean tech bust, which happened quite some time ago, mm. is that still having an impact on the ability of your companies to raise or... And also, is it, it's very, this is very different to what I'm used to, but like, how much, how much technological innovation is required? Are these like deep tech companies that have a huge amount of R&D to do? Or is it a more like a um, software type approach where you're faster to revenue? So two questions. One is about the impact of the last clean tech bust. Yep. Okay. So mostly it's new firms in, in the clean tech or climate tech space. It's not it's not older VCs. So 
what we went through was a right. period where people thought that clean tech could be as venturable as software and then were thoroughly and brutally disavowed of that hypothesis. Was there any winners at all? Like, was there one winner or it was all just... In the long term, if, if people had held their stakes, then they would have, but I think... Yep. I don't know. I don't know of that many people who, like, fun at the fund level, yep. on net made a made a yep. success of it. What a lot of people did was realize that in order to traverse the cost curve in in commodity markets, you have to start with premium products. So actually, a lot of people moved into um, pharmaceutical supply chains and yep. food additives, yep. um, and then gradually think about growing the scale and efficiency of their processes to be equivalent to a commodity scale product, yep. which is a thesis that people make use of today and it's a reason why people are a little bit less nervous because they can see very clearly the kind of that we learn a lot from that last bust makes sense but a lot of the capital we don't have the scale of capital i think today um as a portion of vc that we did in that bust although i might be wrong on that I need to fact check that um it's definitely much better than it was and the fact that there's ma massive regulatory pressure towards clean tech yeah is definitely helping shift funds into the space. Yep. The Inflation Reduction Act in the US and the kind of tit for tat uh, equivalent policy that the EU is cooking up suggests probably a firestorm of subsidies that are going to make it very venturable to be in climate. Interesting. And the interesting thing about that space is people think about it as kind of subsidy and therefore unstable. I think there are probably self fulfilling prophecies in that subsidy which allow it, for example, renewables to become as competitive as natural gas for example yep. that's kind of what happened and with solar who, who's who's going to win is it going to be the the shells the bps the aramcos who pivot because they've got so much capability and resource or is it going to be a total step change like the early internet companies now largely don't exist right total step change um the early camera companies largely don't exist now do they because there's been a total step change Pharmaceutical companies, they've kind of stuck around and just become huge beasts. Do you think it's going to be the companies that you're seeing now um, who may get bought? Or do you think that the oil and gas industry is just going to somehow pivot completely and, and win? If you think about the value chain for the plastic lining on this uh, coffee cup that I yeah. have here, yeah, uh, it, starts in, it starts in, for example, the North Sea and it ends... In, in your cup, in your hand here, and it's such a vast, it's a vast hyper integrated industry. Yeah. And if you wanted to substitute one component in the middle of that value chain, so say you wanted to replace the plastic with an alginate, for example, and you go to the to one of the companies in that value chain and you try and sell them this, it could be better on a like on the basis of that single exchange. Mm. It may be worse for the supplier or for the for the customer. Mm -hmm. You're going to really struggle. Mm. And so my own thesis is that if we really want to be successful we probably need to change really long stretches of the value chain yeah simultaneously yeah it's the same probably in pharmaceuticals the pharmaceutical industry being even more integrated and even longer in terms of like starting the process to getting the result mm -hmm. i think that's why for example com computational drug discovery we've been promising it for like 20 years or so one of the reasons why it's been so hard for those companies to break in even if they're better at one step or two steps of yep. the overall drug discovery process is that those steps vanishingly small percentage yep. of the overall value chain it's the yep. same it's the same with climate tech and actually like a rational approach would have started at the sector level and said we need to start a pharmaceutical company not a biotech um same way with 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 clean tech we but you have to raise a massive amount of money to start a pharmaceutical exactly company, right? yeah exactly yeah. and so so then what we've decided to do instead of creating one company at a time is to create several companies at a time that form as much of the value chain as we can so take an example um, of e-fuels e-fuels are basically electricity goes in and fuel comes out um and this is kind of maybe our our version of, bio, of biofuels <laughs> this is the climate the climate tech version of biofuels so, um climate clean tech 2.0's version of biofuels trying to come up with an alternative to petrochemical fuels um in order to make it work to do an e-fuel you need carbon dioxide you need hydrogen and you need some way of combining those into a fuel because okay. all fuels are carbon some combination of carbon and hydrogen yep. and plastics too yeah at the moment we don't have cheap ways 
or clean ways of producing carbon dioxide. Clean means low carbon emissions, is that right? As in ideally carbon negative. Carbon. Ideally, like ideally we're mining the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Okay. What will happen to the world if we mine all the carbon dioxide? We're not going to mine all the carbon dioxide. It's we're, we're, we're trying to get it back to a steady state. We are. Yeah. Um, even if we do a gigaton of carbon dioxide a year, we're yeah. not going to, we're not going to remove all the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's probably going to be fine. Mm. Um, What's your vision for the future? Do you think all cars will become, this is probably such a classical vision, but all cars become electric, no carbon based fuels anymore, more reforestation, plastic somehow become sustainable, that kind of thing. Is that like your vision or does it go further? Like what does the UK look like if we do it right? I don't know. And I'm not in the business of trends or forecasting. All I know is that there are constraints on, on electricity production, electricity storage, carbon dioxide production, hydrogen production, hydrogen storage. And by kind of systematically focusing on those constraints, you make them available as tools for a clean economy. Mm. And, I, and it's impossible to work out what the exact composition of the economy is going to be at the end, whether or not right. it, like much debated is like electricity versus hydrogen. I don't think we need to have that debate ever, frankly. Like I think there will always be a market for green hydrogen if it's cheaper than brown hydrogen and mm -hmm. better for the world. And the same with electricity. Uh, if you can produce electricity as cheaply as you can from burning natural gas from solar, and and that's true or levelized cost-wise all the way through to the, the use point via whatever storage mechanism you have, then we will use it. Um, and for the companies that develop the technologies that underlie that, the market will always be massive. So I'm less of the school of trying to predict you know where where to place my chat chips and more on the on the on the basis of if we get this technology to, to beat the incumbent technology then there will be a market for it 100 percent. so carbon dioxide is a really interesting one because there are a lot of the bets that are being placed in carbon dioxide removal at the moment are betting on voluntary markets so voluntary markets are people voluntarily offsetting their emissions by purchasing carbon offsets to remove carbon from the atmosphere yeah. But carbon dioxide is also a massive commodity chemical. It's a, it's a commodity chemical worth billions in, in Europe alone. Is it? People purchase it in vast commodity quantities because it's a chemical input to lots of processes. And also, I suppose, it's a, um, you need to create an anaerobic environment. You've probably got some carbon dioxide in there, even though there's some O2. Like, I think for gas mixtures, for growing bugs, for example, there's some carbon dioxide. So You might do that by filtering out the oxygen, though, mm. rather than by... I think, the ga I think the gas mixtures that we use have a mixture of methane, nitrogen, and, and CO2, I think. Yeah. CO2 yeah. is a, a gas that's yeah. often used in the lab. Um, yeah. and, and it's also, you use it in construction materials. Carbon dioxide is bought, bought in yeah. vast quantities by people who produce aggregates, for example. Hmm. We use it in the curing of cement. Um, and there are more things we can make it out of, make out of carbon dioxide as well. Yeah. But you need to change the processes. So probably there's always going to be a supply chain for carbon dioxide. And the first customers are actually... Yep. people who already use it yep. rather than voluntary so that makes sense and um what about uh nuclear energy i don't have a strong stance on nuclear um we haven't done a lot of work in energy generation because it's even harder to crack than than fuels for example because there you really do have a like a vast and monolithic hyper integrated embedded legacy sector you know if you think about grid integration and uh, it's it's a it's a the, real the grid we have though is not it's not like if you speak to anyone in the construction industry who wants to do big projects mm -hmm. maybe it's different in Scotland to it is elsewhere in the UK but they say yeah the the grid is not is robust enough access to power is mm -hmm. is challenging so you're in some respects constrained there by the grid I'm not going to argue with you. And, and 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 probably a lot of people could would argue that the major barrier to more integrations is grid scale storage, energy storage. Yeah. Oh. To to deal with variability. Because a lot of our infrastructure now is just not adequate. I mean, our, our rail infrastructure, road infrastructure. I don't know how good our sewage infrastructure is. I do. I do think so. Electrification of processes, especially if it's electrification. We're getting into the, like the specifics here, but electrification of processes that are not simply substituting a kind of thermochemical or like heat-based process. Yep. They're not simply replacing natural gas for electricity in that process, but instead they're, they're truly electrifying it. So they're making it an electrochemical process, like a low temperature process. The difference there will be that 
those processes can scale up and scale down depending on the price of electricity in a way that thermochemical processes cannot. So in a heat-based process, you have to spin it up to a temperature. Yeah. You've got to keep that temperature level. You need consistent supply. Yeah. But in electrochemical processes or like fully electrified processes, you can spin them up and down very quickly. Yeah. So actually, they can be used as leveling off technologies sense. as yeah. an alternative to really expensive storage. Yeah. So is that like having an air fryer? No. Like having an air fryer. Air fryer versus use an air fryer versus a pan. No. Because it heats up. I've never used an air fryer. It heats up electrically. The toaster heats up electrically, whereas something else is gas and there's like the the transfer of gas heat to the pan. Maybe it's a terrible example. And any, well, phys so, so any physicists who are listening. But electrification like of heat is, is a really um, good example where probably if you're electrifying heat, you want it to be to spin up and stay up because you want to you want to keep the heat level high. Yes. Because, because you've got to go through, it takes a lot of energy to get the temperature up. So you want to keep the temperature high. And so you don't want to spin it down. So if you can use like kind of a heat battery to keep the the heat but this is already something you're doing if you're doing thermochemical process hmm. in general i think it's going to be better for a grid an overall grid if people are using fewer heat-based processes but maybe we've gone a little far into the no it's all right we can talk about anything on this podcast uh, <laughs> i'm i'm now straying into areas i don't know much about at all but i do also i do also know that energy storage is really hard yes um and it's always i've always struggled with it a little bit because humans are so good at storing energy like we could go for we could power ourselves in our brain for you know two weeks really if we really needed to without <laughs> any energy input yeah but our man-made ways of storing energy are really poor mm. right that's a big challenge everyone talks about like batteries are just not that great why is that because it's the the law of thermodynamics you know it can't be created or destroyed then it just finds another place to go or we spent a really long time looking at batteries um, and we produced a company in the space. We actually looked at fat-based batteries. Oh, really? Yeah, we looked wow. at it a little bit. Um, so this is using the human example I just gave, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Very storage. literally. Fat storage, yeah. Um, Very literally. So you were literally talking about a fat battery? Yeah. Oh, wow. Or a fattery. A fattery. Yeah. <laughs> um, this just goes to show you guys really do, you know, you explore everything fully don't you and well we look at the principles of it yeah so yeah. like wherever energy is stored we'll use that as an example we'll think about why that example is imperfect yeah and what would it take to solve that imperfection yeah. so really looks at like absurd or difficult things um there's a concept from film called suspension of disbelief which is where viewers willingly ignore the fact that what they're viewing is impossible or incredible um just for the enjoyment of the film but mm. we use the suspension of disbelief in the development of new concepts which is you know a fattery is obviously a stupid idea, but if you look at it for long enough, then if it was possible to make it work, then you'd discover that. Um, and the reason that people probably haven't worked it out is that the perception of impossibility acts like a barrier to entry yeah. in that space. Did you create a fattery? No, we did not. No. Um, what we ended up working out for that case was we also look, instead of just looking at each chemistry, chemistry by chemistry, we also look at a systemic view on battery development. And one of the things we really struggled with was comparing different battery chemistries because mm. different batteries are characterized at different scales in the lab using different equipment. And those differ from what the industrially produced battery would look like. So an example would be you're going to do uh, like a benchtop test on just on just the kind of anode or just the cathode, just one component of the battery. Mm. And then maybe you formulate that into like a pouch cell, which is kind of like a really quick and dirty way of making mm. a battery. But then when you actually get into industrial production, it's probably going to be maybe like a like a cylinder type shape. You know, you roll the materials together to form a battery. Um, and there's a lot of difference between the interactions, between the materials used and the heating and the cooling and the cycle times and the survival of those materials from that bench shop to the industrial production of mm. the thing. Mm. And you also need to think about how producing the thing at bench correlates to producing it at industrial scale. Right. And they're not, they're not related. No. There's a lot of discontinuity between the two. So where we focused on was trying to create processes of discovering battery chemistries where the discovery process was indexed to performance at an industrial scale. So how could we make the benchtop look as much like the industrial scale as possible and have a consistent yep. data set um, at the bench scale yep. that would allow us to predict performance at industrial? Because we, we just couldn't, 
looking at this at the landscape, we couldn't make a decision on which chemistry. We just didn't have the data. Mm. I imagine this is deeply analogous in many, many therapeutic spaces Absolutely. where the assay or the yeah. uh, or, or the small scale test just is, bears no re bears no resemblance whatsoever to the human context. Yeah. Absolutely. And also when you're scaling up a process um, or an analytical method, you know, you can see massive variability. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't know how relevant all the assays are on the bench top to all the assays in the human person, but I think the biggest limitation is that the, the body is, you know, it's the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. It's a constant 24-7, 365 interaction between everything. Mm -hmm. And that's at the moment, I think, impossible to model. Um, maybe it's possible with the computers at some point in time, but I don't think we've even managed to model a cell yet, a no. single cell. And that's like, a, that's like a really hard challenge that people are working on, isn't it? How do we actually, in silico, model a cell? I've heard Sir Paul Nur Nurse talk about that a mm -hmm. lot. Like, we've just not man been able to do that. Um, but obviously, I think that the computers are having an impact. Mm -hmm. And that's a bigger and bigger impact. Um, and now I think people are really starting to see, it's starting to become real for people because of the chat GPT um, sort of explosion of interest mm -hmm. and clinicians and other people who have spent a long, long time learning their trade are asking the program questions or I don't know if it's a program or is it, I don't know. I don't know what to call it, but they're asking the chat GPT questions. A person. Yeah. A person, yeah. They're asking the chat GPT <laughs> questions and it's coming up with really solid, mm -hmm. not always, but solid answers. And that's like, whoa, mm -hmm. okay, it's really here now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, but again, I'm not an expert and I, I can't really go much further than that. What's driving you forward now that you've built this up and you've created um 25 companies is that right 35 30 35 companies and some of them are now probably now scaling up mm -hmm. dsv has probably got equity in some of those companies yeah all of them if i've done my paperwork correctly yeah, if you've done the paperwork correctly exactly um and uh so what what are the next steps for you and what gets you most excited being an organization that thinks a lot about constraints and like systematically understanding what is limiting things ha has a reflexive component yeah so we think a lot about the factors that limit us as well yeah and we don't have an in silico model of dsv yet <laughs> that can predict you know how we will respond to different alterations in our con yeah. constitution but we have a pretty good understanding so we have a kind of outcome map of dsv in terms of the things that limit us and the things that we think are hard or impossible. And we're focused on resolving those. So one of the really obvious limitations is supply of talent. Yeah. So to your companies and to our companies, yeah. To found to found them. And to you. And DSV. And to to DSV as well. And specifically we're looking for people who have deep expertise and creativity and ambition and and, 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 you yeah, know, yeah. there's a lot of conditions and it filters well, they, us down. You wanted them to join you full time. And we want them to be committed. Yeah. And to, so you're competing with all the other. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things we did recently was create a PhD program saw that, to yeah. try and train people. I'm glad you saw that. That's yeah. good. I was very excited about that. Actually. Yeah. I commented. I was like, this is really cool. I'm really excited about it. When we started DSV, the other thing I was thinking about was a postgraduate university, but at 25, and with no credentials, that seemed a bit too far. So I thought I would just work with Mark and try and create science companies from scratch instead. Yeah. So, <laughs> but we've now come around to to training PhDs and um we've we've managed to secure enough funding to run the first cohort. Yeah. Um just about enough funding. I'd love to double the size of the cohort in okay. case anyone is listening who might be able to help us do that. Yeah. And it's a three year PhD, which is not unheard of. There's lots of three year PhDs yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, focused entirely on venture creation. So you, instead of becoming an expert in a single discipline, you've become an expert in a single societal problem and you explore all the possible ways of solving that over that time period. Wow. And in doing so, seek to start a company to scale to solve that problem. So talent is one of the things that we're really focused on. One of the other things we're really focused on is how you do that mapping of the problem space. Hmm. Um, so what we have is in producing 35 companies, we've produced more than 35 maps of different spaces that form a kind of yep. integrated caucus of materials. Interesting. Um, and we've also seen really close up how people 
are when they're successful in ideation and when they're unsuccessful in ideation. Mm. And because we don't take ideation as like primal, we take it as a core part of our process. We've spent a lot of time and energy thinking about how you increase the probability of hitting on an interesting concept and developing an interesting idea instead of solving a problem that's going to be superseded by a more global solution. Instead, mm. how do you operate at the level of the most effective thing? Mm. And automating some of that process needs to happen. So when you do a literature review or when you try and amalgamate the learnings from multiple different people or when you look at the kind of logical tree of concepts that that you've got and you say, if I do A and B, this will work. Or if I do A, B and C, this will work. But mm -hmm. which one is more probable mm -hmm. in, in terms of affecting the thing above it, the outcome mm -hmm. above it. Mm -hmm. So we've built software to do that. And we are, um, it's one of the most exciting things we've ever done, I think, because it's like kind of like having a virtual scientist in the, in the, in the organization, uh, really focused on kind of growing that tool to sort of, uh, amplify, uh, everyone that we get in. Mm -hmm. We've got this search engine, which, uh, helps us find people, but, um, there's just so much more we can do with it. Mm -hmm. Um, really excited about growing that. Mm -hmm. Um, we want to do, I mean, in every sector that we're working in, there are just untold number of problems that we'd like to work on. Um, and we'd like to be able to continue to fund our companies past the point that we fund them now. So yeah, which is, a, you go up to what stage, series A? No, we, we do pre-seed investments. Yep. Uh, and we follow on in a small subset of our companies with a very small ticket. Yeah. And if our companies are outside of a hype cycle, we'd love to be able to. So what we have uniquely is this kind of arbitrage opportunity where other people are kind of clumping together and focusing on the things that are working really, really well and have always, and have worked recently. Um, we're focused on the things that have not yet worked, but which are on the verge of working really effectively. Yep. And we'd love to be able to push people through those kind of doldrums and hype cycles. Yep. Um, uh, to double down on companies which we know have got the correct thesis, yep. but are suffering from the fact that people just aren't looking at that space. So you probably need a couple hundred million pounds in a fund, right? So ideally, ideally uh, more than that. Because yep. what, what I'd love to be able to do is take that sector level thesis and fund multiple companies simultaneously yep. and then create these kind of ecosystems yeah. of companies that could replace the incumbent. And that's not unprecedented though, is it? I mean, maybe doing it through your approach is unprecedented, but I can name several VCs who have created so many companies like flagship ventures, for example, mm -hmm. Atlas, you know, they, that's what they do. They, they, they create ideas from scratch. They do. Yeah. And I think the next logical step if for you guys to evolve, to evolve the kind of flagship Atlas model is to do rational design of sectors. It's yep. hard enough to do rational design of very, very small things, but yep. it's also hard to do rational design of very, very big things. So like in an ideal world, how would the pharmaceutical industry work? Wow. Okay. And then how do we create the kind of ecosystem or galaxy of companies that will substantiate that vision? Yeah. And then how do we fund them simultaneously to make it real, to materialize it? <clears throat> that makes me really excited. So if you do do that, call me. Because uh, <laughs> that gets me really excited. I love them. James, we're, do we're, we're trying our best to do it right now. <laughs> we're just a little undercapitalized. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you. Just want to say thank you um, for coming on. Uh, no, it was really nice. Yeah. It was really yeah. good chat. Yeah. Um, I don't get to talk enough about the analogies between the work we do in therapeutics and the work we do in climate and why it makes sense to do them both. Good, good. So this is really, it's like... Good. Is there anything else you'd like to cover that you think might be worthwhile giving some airtime? I don't think so. I think, the, the only th I think we've covered a lot of the things I wanted to talk uh, about. It's been an awesome conversation. You also asked me a fair few questions as well, which is quite unusual. I've not had that before. <laughs> I had way more questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I... Really liked it actually. It was good, a good mix. Thank you. Cheers. Much appreciated.